Well, welcome everyone. Uh, it's one minute to go, but I'm going to start early uh, because this topic is going to be so interesting, really will be. Uh, great pleasure to introduce our two speakers tonight, Dr. Warwick Brunton and Dr. Susan Jack. Uh, Dr. Brunton is um, honorary lecturer in uh, the Department of Preventive and Social Medicine, and Dr. Jack is Medical Officer of Health and Clinical Director of Health, Public Health South. And the topic uh, tonight is the Grim Reaper's Second Harvest, Reflections on the 1918 epi Influenza Epidemic in Dunedin with a Coronavirus Slant. So, please welcome our speakers. Thank you. very much for inviting us this evening to share our thoughts on the 1918 flu epidemic. Uh, the newspapers have been full of references to the parallels and some of those I'm sure will uh, strike you as we uh, talk from our various perspectives. Me as a health historian and former health administrator, public health administrator and Susan in her capacity as the Medical Officer of Health. Uh, the past insights are very, very valuable indeed for this uh, initiative. So, I'll deal with the first four parts of it, looking at the pandemic of 1918 in context, talk just a little bit about the health system in New Zealand in 1918, then uh, rush through the way in which the pandemic was managed in Dunedin and look and from a national perspective at the lasting impact of the pandemic and then Susan will offer her reflections from a COVID-19 perspective. So let's put the Spanish influenza as it was known at the time, uh, in context. It's been described as the greatest medical holocaust in history. The latest estimates of the number of people who died in it are somewhere between 50 and 100 million people. In New Zealand, there were nearly 9,000 casualties. In three months, half as many New Zealanders died of the flu as were killed in the First World War. Uh, in Dunedin here, um, there were 273 Pākehā deaths. Māori deaths are much harder to ascertain um, because of the uh, recording systems of the day. Um, and it's estimated that about 40% of the New Zealand population was affected by it. That was nearly half a million people at the time. The pandemic went through two waves. Originating, it appears, in military camps in the United States, the Midwest, uh, in about April of 1918, and then sent across in troop ships to the American troops who joined the Allied forces on the Western Front. The disease was then spread by the evacuation of casualties <coughs> and troops on home leave um, on both sides of the front, returning particularly to cities in Europe. It had some significant military uh, impact. A major British advance was delayed because of casualties from the flu although the precise details were censored and we'll never know exactly what the impact was. The bigger problem was a second wave of the flu, which was a more virulent and pneumonic form of the bacillus, which spread uh, from Europe and the United Kingdom to North America and then to the rest of the world. And the contemporary chart will show you uh, just the way in which it travelled um, to the rest of the world. The great advantage for New Zealand was 
that we had time to prepare. Ships took about five to six weeks to travel from the United Kingdom to New Zealand. Overseas cables brought news to the media, and so the local newspapers, with a couple of excerpts there uh, from July, August, show that things were really starting to take effect in the Northern Hemisphere. Telegrams and phones allowed for internal communication of the news, uh, but the official channels were much slower. Uh, official advice on how to deal with it was dispatched from London in July 1919, after the pandemic here, and by the time it arrived and was passed from the Governor General to the Prime Minister to the Minister to the Public Health Advi uh, Department, that was four months away and it was too late. The key point to note, though, is that no preparation occurred. There was no ready-made national or regional operational plans, and as the head of the Public Health Department told the Minister, the Public Health Act is your plan. For all that, quarantine law was well established through facilities uh, which were run down, but they had only applied to gazetted infectious and dangerous infectious diseases. Inevitably, the pandemic hit New Zealand. There's some debate about which ship was actually responsible uh, for bringing uh, the pandemic to the country, but it appears most likely that there was a troop ship arriving at Auckland about the 11th or 12th of October in 1918, and there were infectious cases aboard which may have been diagnosed as the milder form so the ship was cleared and the passengers allowed to disembark. From Auckland, it spread very quickly. Coastal shipping and the inter-island ferries brought it to other main ports around the country, and the railway system being the main form of communication uh, and passenger transport then spread it from the coast inland to various settlements. So, within just a few weeks, the whole country was effectively uh, affected by this pandemic. Well, how were we set up to deal with it? Public administration in 1918 was essentially a problem of functional and geographical fragmentation. There was a central government, public health, hospitals and charitable aid department, uh, formed from a merger of separate public health and separate hospitals uh, departments in 1909. In Otago Southland there were six autonomous hospital and charitable aid boards. There were 47 independent local authorities, cities, boroughs, counties, town districts. Then there was the private sector, 36 private practitioners in Dunedin, mostly concentrated at the top of High Street or in Stewart Street. There were private hospitals and, of course, many pharmacies. But it was the central government and its agency which was largely responsible for having to attend to the crisis. The minister of the day, George Russell, was a somewhat overbearing man who carried a number of portfolios. He was a hands-on sort of minister and was very keen to reform the public health department and bring in more professionals. They certainly need it because of wartime staff depletion. The 12 staff in the head office were reduced to eight. The six district officers were reduced to four, district health officers being the, at the time, um, the name of medical office health at the time. The health inspectors had been removed from their direct management <coughs> responsibility and transferred to hospital boards in 1910. So it was a pretty chaotic sort of system. Within the department, the situation was even worse. The head of the department, Thomas uh, Valentine, had been seconded in April to the Defence Department to plan hospitals uh, for returning um, soldiers. Uh, likewise, the senior medical officer of health, or district health officer of McGill from Auckland, was out of action working with Defence Department as well. 
That put the responsibility on Joseph Friendly, who was a career public health man, and he stepped up as the acting chief health officer. But then when the crisis hit Auckland, he was sent up to investigate the situation, found it so serious that he needed to stay on there. So he was out of action, trying to run a national pandemic by phone and telegram uh, and remote control. In reality, the minister then stepped in to the head office and effectively ran it as the chief executive. Dunedin was extremely fortunate in that there was a strong public health presence, unlike any other centre in the country. The medical officer of health or district health officer was a 27-year-old um, veteran of the First World War who was seconded from defence to um, take up the position of district health officer in Dunedin after a series of stopgap appointments. He was given a crash course in public health, uh, and brief orientation in Wellington, then left to look after the area with virtually no backup. He was a neophyte but very diligent man, quiet, thoughtful, gentlemanly, described as calm, efficient, and an unobtrusive way of working. He managed the crisis in Dunedin until we went down with flu himself in early December. New Zealand's foremost hospital administrator, Alex Faulkner, was medical superintendent of uh, Dunedin Hospital. He had a diploma in public health and a strong interest in public health and infectious diseases, but his hospital administration responsibilities uh, took him um, away from public health activities. Besides, he was down with the flu himself for most of November. So they co-opted New Zealand's first diplomat in public health, John Bowie, who had been an ex-medical missionary in Vanuatu, and he was left to run Dunedin Hospital as best he could. As a background figure, Professor Sidney Chanteloup, the first professor of public health and bacteriology and the deputy dean of the medical school, uh, was prepared to step in and assist and undoubtedly provided a great role as a mentor. He was very able and far-sighted and had had experience as district health officer in Dunedin. So he played a very important part behind the scenes and had some extraordinary insights about public health organisation after the pandemic. Well, how was the pandemic managed? It essentially falls into three phases. An initial phase, which was under local management, uh, because it seems to be, at any rate, because the uh, health department records of that period are virtually non-existent. Um, so it seems to have been under local management until the peak phase uh, from 6th of November till early December when that was centrally and nationally managed. Then uh, recovery was essentially left in the hands of local administration again from about the 3rd of December. The timing is incredibly significant because the pandemic outbreak here and in New Zealand coincided with the huge celebrations and the outpouring of relief and rejoicing at the end of the First World War. From a public health perspective, the Chief Health Officer advised postponing celebrations, but as you could imagine, no politician was going to interfere with civic celebrations. In Dunedin, there were additional local factors. The Christchurch anniversary weekend uh, inevitably brought extra trainloads of people uh, on excursions from the south for the long weekend, and 1918 was no exception. There were no extra precautions taken, and that undoubtedly added to the subsequent peak. And Dr. Farris also noted that the Winton races seemed to have caused a small peak afterwards. The initial response was undertaken through public health surveillance, and by all accounts, um, the district health officer 
had good contacts with uh, GPs, and they were starting to probably identify occasional cases of flu in late October. Uh, but there are no official records because it, um, influenza was not an infectious or dangerous infectious disease. So there were a number of initiatives which were undertaken uh, primarily at local mm -hmm. level and throughout because of the effective liaison between the district health office and the two daily newspapers uh, they were very responsive to suggestions and advice offered officially um, and they had a very good working relationship. One of the first steps involved was to issue advice. This was done in the form of newspapers in the local daily newspapers um, and that was very simple, straightforward, probably coined here in Dunedin. I think the particular uh, points of interest given the circumstances are instructions two and three which are as close as what we would now call social distancing ever got. The second point was the district office encouraged schools to have twice daily gargle parades <laughs> and as you can see from the advertisement uh, agents uh, of the particular brand, favoured brand very quickly tried to capitalise on this um, to increase their sales. Municipal liaison was also very important and the district office uh, called for disinfection of uh, tram cars, cable cars, railway carriages, theatres and halls with a, a disinfectant of 2% formalin solution and that was readily carried out without any concerns. Anticipating a crisis, extra hospital beds and temporary hospitals were prepared. Dunedin Hospital at the time consisted of 246 beds. They immediately cleared two wards to make way for flu admissions. All surgery was transferred to Professor Barnett's private hospital and only uh, urgent cases were admitted apart from the flu. There were very tight visiting restrictions and the uh, hospital prepared for contingencies by overflow accommodation using the Knox Sunday School buildings on this very site and the Hanover Street Sunday School, uh, back to Sunday School building uh, which is still around. That again showed a strong degree of local coordination between the district health officer and the hospital system. The other local initiative involved the installation of public inhalation chambers. Uh, these were sprayers of a zinc sulfate solution um, which were made at either at Hillside Railway Workshops or by A&T BERT. Um, and there was mixed opinion as to how valuable these might be, but I guess the main advantage was the psychological advantage that people felt they were able to try and prevent being hit by the flu by inhaling this stuff, and volunteers and uh, ex-soldiers and um, public health staff operated these facilities. But as the flu took hold, it had an extraordinary impact on city life. <laughs> Transport was disrupted. The wharves were said to have had a deserted appearance. Local train and tram services were reduced to skeletal levels. There was limited goods traffic on the railway system. Suburban postal deliveries were affected. And at the telephone exchange, they had to restrict calls to urgent calls only. 43 out of 63 phone operators were down with flu at one stage. Industrial production was also severely affected. Roslyn Woolen Mill, 150 workers sick at the same time. The Ross and Van Dinning um, hat, mantle and boot department store, which still stands in Stafford Street, 105 workers down at once. They give you just an idea of the impact 
on the life of the city. The health services were completely overwhelmed by it, particularly in mid to late November. One city doctor reputedly saw 80 patients one day at the height of the pandemic. Pharmacies were forced to close for an hour or two daily simply to meet the backlog of prescriptions. Ken Thorne and Pross's National Warehouse couldn't keep up with the demand for national orders. The hospital bore the brunt of it. The medical superintendent was down with the flu and only one in five house surgeons remained at the post. A huge influx of admissions peaking at about 45 on the 25th of November. They were stretched to capacity with desperate pleas for volunteers. And of course the main peak came with the false and the genuine German armistice uh, in the 5th and 6th and the 12th of November. Imagine a crowd of up to 30,000 people <coughs> packed into the octagon and the adjacent streets. Outdoor activity was supposedly okay. Now that was going on all around the country And it was at that stage that the minister took over and implemented a national plan. The key to it was declaring influenza to be a dangerous, infectious disease. That then enabled uh, the district health officers to exercise special powers under public health legislation. So for several weeks, this 27-year-old neophyte medical officer of health, as we would now call him, was the uncrowned and most powerful man in the whole of Dunedin. A number of other initiatives were taken at the same time. Rapid burials were ordered. Uh, people needed to be buried uh, 24 hours after they had died. There was some censorship. The minister was scared stiff of the uh, numbers of casualties um, from influenza, so details of, new, of numbers were banned from publication. There was some market regulation and community mobilisation. But it was the special hour powers which were the key element. And so Dr. Farris ordered community facilities uh, to be closed and gatherings prohibited. Educational services shut recreational activities ceased and worship was very strictly regulated indeed. Limitations and restrictions were imposed on the sale of food and beverages. And then some amusements and trades were shut down altogether because of the risk of spreading infection. On top of that, a number of shops and businesses uh, decided that they would reduce their hours so staff could have some time in the fresh air, say from about three o'clock in the afternoon, and weekend uh, factory work and shopping was closed as well by voluntary initiatives. But the health service was in complete distress. And this is where Professor Chanteloup came to the rescue. He immediately uh, arranged for fourth and fifth year students, medicine being a five year course in those days, to play doctor uh, by uh, sending these senior medical students to Auckland and the main hospitals in New Zealand. They were given full prescribing rights and to all sense, intents and purposes uh, they acted as registered doctors. Fourth year students were held to assist uh, general practices where doctors were down with the flu and stretched uh, under some form of supervision. Academic teaching staff provided local supervision for students seconded to general practices. First and second year medical students were co-opted as nurses in Dunedin Hospital. <coughs> 
by all accounts and purposes, they loved the chance to play doctor or nurse, and um, it was a great it was a great success. Mm. The community was also strongly mobilised, and for the war footing had in fact really ensured that there was a good infrastructure in place to mobilise a voluntary effort. The key person in this was a man we would probably now describe as the city missioner, uh, the Reverend Brian King, uh, whose work uh, with Red Cross and St John Ambulance in the First World War earned him the OBE in the first uh, awards of that decoration. He was described as a great organiser um, and he was very well known and respected uh, for his mission activities. He was an indefatigable worker and as one newspaper said, he worked like a Trojan the entire epidemic long. And it was to him that Dr. Farris turned to organise central depots for inquiries. Um, these were uh, where calls could be registered and staff, uh, nurses and student volunteers dispatched to assist families in need uh, who showed that they needed home help of some sort by putting a white flag outside. Boy Scouts and community volunteers noted these, reported them to a central system from whence the aid was provided. Um, and the, uh, the Bureau, thanks to uh, Mr King's work, raised £1,700 for relief work. They organised the volunteers, they prepared food, invalid food, they supervised a range of suburban Bureau and they arranged a bulk supply of oranges for Dunedin. Quite extraordinary. The state also stepped in by issuing national health education uh, posters. I have one of these on the front desk. To the best of my knowledge, it is only one of two surviving copies uh, left. It's very official in its tone and it ends by order with the signature of the director of the uh, chief health officer. You're welcome to peruse that later on. The government also intervened through market regulation because of the profiteering which was taking place. Dunedin, the price of lemons rocketed from threepence to sevenpence, so the government imposed price controls on that <coughs> at threepence. Disinfectants started to increase in price through private sales, so the government arranged for bulk supplies to be made available through local bodies. Cough medicines and proprietary medicines also escalated in price from about one and sixpence to three and sixpence a bottle. So again, the government intervened with a standard formula medicine distributed a shilling a bottle through uh, the hospital or the central bureau. More than that, the government made alcohol available only on prescription for some days. The boat prohibitionists, needless to say, were delighted but the most significant impact on um, the uh, market was an attempt to try and get general practitioners to work in an organised and systematic fashion. The city was divided into 16 blocks, the idea being that one doctor would be allocated to that particular block and looked after all patients and all calls in that area. Uh, irrespective of the regular GP. It was a system which had worked very well in Christchurch. Uh, and the central registry operating through the Bureau would refer names twice daily and then the GP would be paid after he had seen the people concerned. Private practitioners were extremely reluctant to adopt it and only did so very belatedly and they dropped it as fast as they could. It was seen as a great threat to private progress. The broke practice. By early December, things were starting to settle down. The wave had passed. So restrictions were gradually eased and lifted, uh, primarily again at local level. 
transport systems returned to normal, factory work picked up again, the auxiliary hospitals were closed, the bureaus disbanded, they brought people together to see what could be learnt from the situation, and very importantly, uh, there were recognition of those who had volunteered or contributed to managing the epidemic with certificates uh, from the hospital board and from the Minister of Health. <coughs> and perhaps particularly important was the work of the city missioner, which was recognised. Public subscription raised a thousand pounds and provided a car to Brian King as recognition for the monumental work he had done. Well, the local impact of it can be seen from the statistics, the localities which were worst affected, and the survivors uh, of widows and dependent children and orphans in the area, with special orphanages being set up around the city. The news media had reported all the details and there are some very heartbreaking stories which they reported of people's, of the conditions under which people were living at that time. That led to a flurry for uh, improved housing and living conditions, but nothing came of it. And in all, something like $3.8 million of public money was expended on health and welfare services in the area. The enduring impact of the pandemic was national rather than local. A commission of inquiry was set up in 1919, strongly guided by public health officials, and the findings were definitely massaged by those same officials, and led to the development of the Public Health, over the Health Act 1920, large chunks of which still survive in its replacement dated 1956. The health department was reorganized and public health assumed a much stronger and semi-separate status within the department. There were organized divisions around particular functions. There were public health programs for women and children. There was a greater spread of uh, expertise at district level so what had been four district officers eventually became 18. And very significantly, the government recognised and the officials recognised that the integration of public health into medical service had been a disaster. And so Chinese walls separated the public health organisation within the department uh, from the hospital oversight components of the department and that survived until the formation of area health boards in the 1980s. The other important element was the recognition of the role of health education. And beyond that, the deficiencies in coordination of health care started to sow the seeds for a national health service. There was widespread support for this, the idea was adopted by the Labour Party in 1922 and formed the formation of the Social Security Scheme, which was partly implemented in 1938-41. New Zealand was also very strong in saying this sort of pandemic requires strong international cooperation and leadership. So we played a part in agitating for the formation of a specialised secretariat under the League of Nations in 1923, forerunner of today's World Health Organisation. And then, in the next century, health officials in the ministry actually asked historians, what can we learn? And it's a remarkable trip if you look through the uh, pandemic plan for avian flu and swine flu, which is developed by the Ministry of Health, to see the uh, imprint of Jeff Rice, uh, Canterbury historian uh, and the expert on the 1918 pandemic in New Zealand. So there was a case of applied history, um, if ever there was one. 
So as a transition, can I leave you for, with some final thoughts from the American public health expert Milton Terrace about what we can learn from experiences um, of the past as we approach the new challenges of today. So when you're absorbing that, I'll hand over to Susan. Okay, well thanks Eric. Um, I think I probably have had it pretty easy after hearing what we told them. Okay, so I'm now going to talk um, about what's happened in coronavirus um, and I'm going to talk about what's happened in New Zealand and then have a section at the end talking more specifically about how we... Can't hear me? How we dealt with things in Dunedin. Um, but first to put some context, and Warwick's given us a lot of context about the 1918-19 flu pandemic. Um, this is all the pandemics back to 541. Um, and here we've got the 1918-19 um, flu pandemic. This is HIV AIDS, so it's a little bit different because that's, of course, a pandemic that is going right till today. Um, but then we've got Asian flu, Hong Kong flu, Russian flu, and down here we've got um, COVID-19. Today I checked and the number, I think we're up to 1.45 million deaths and we've just tipped over to 60 million cases. So this is not the end of the story here for COVID, um, but hopefully not too far away. So the origins of COVID, I'm sure many of you are aware that it was first noted coming out of a um, seafood market in Wuhan in China. Um, but now they're, they're thinking that was probably likely the amplification site rather than the actual source. And they're still trying to work out what the actual or where the source came from. Um, very quickly, the virus was sequenced, and that's one of the amazing tools that we have at our disposal today is the whole genome sequencing. And so very quickly, we knew that it was a coronavirus belonging to the bat coronavirus family. And these we were not unfamiliar with. We've had severe acute respiratory syndrome in 2002. Um, we've had MERS, which is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome in 2012. Um, and then we had COVID-19. So all of these were bat coronaviruses that went through an intermediary host, a civet cat, a camel, and they think for COVID it may have been the pangolin, um, but again it might have been directly from the bat that's still also being investigated. But we're all very um, familiar with uh, the common cold coronaviruses, so there are four human coronaviruses that are always circulating. Um, as I mentioned, the whole genome sequencing has been a remarkable tool for being able to track this pandemic. And this is probably the first pandemic where whole genome sequencing has really come into its own, where we can see, we don't have to have a look at charts to see where it's, it's going. We can track it by doing the genome sequencing. So here's a phylogenetic tree, and now these are published in the papers. You're probably all familiar with them as well. The purple section is the um, original uh, outbreak in China, and then as it spread throughout the world. So this virus has a pretty stable genome. There are mutations, but it doesn't mutate very rapidly, um, enough that you can track where it's going. That does mean that it's really good for vaccine development, because it's relatively stable. It does also mean, though, if you have a, a localised outbreak, trying to work out who's given it to who is not so good because it's, there's not enough mutations to let you know that. Um, this is another graph that I'm sure you're all familiar with. So if you have a population that's um, not immune at all, so everybody is susceptible, and you have a new pathogen, you're going to have a very steep um, bell-shaped curve of your outbreak. And so for COVID, um, back in January when we started hearing about it, no one really knew what this virus was all about, what was the transmission pattern, even how was it transmitted. Um, so quite early on, people talked about trying to flatten the curve. And the things that we had at our disposal were all those things that we had back in 1918. So um, travel restrict restrictions or social distancing, isolation and quarantine, um, avoiding 
um, or banning large gatherings or closing of schools and businesses and so forth. So they weren't anything terribly remarkable, but that was all that we had at our disposal until we could see do we have any treatments that might work and so forth. So the New Zealand approach, um, Warren <coughs> has hinted that out of the 1918 um, flu and then particularly the 2009 H1N1 um, swine flu pandemic, following that New Zealand uh, did develop a whole lot of plans and it was called the Pandemic Influenza Plan um, and these were the steps, so planning for it, keeping it out, stamping it out, managing it and recovering from it. So when COVID came along, pretty much up and down the country, all the public health units and the district health boards dusted off their pandemic plans. Our southern DHV one had last been updated in 2017 and was due for a bit of a refresh. And that's what we used as um, a template of how we were going to manage COVID. These again will be very familiar to you and I think this is one of the, the remarkable things about COVID-19 in New Zealand has been the amazing communication, very, very clearly done. So these um, levels actually also come out of that pandemic plan, um, obviously refined and made fit for COVID, but that clear communication to the public has been an extraordinary measure that has been very successful in New Zealand. Um, this couple here um, deserve great recognition. Um, Dr. Tristram Ingham and Bernadette Jones, they were the ones that came up with the bubble concept. Um, they initially developed it to help the disability sector, but it was picked up by the Ministry of Health and by the Prime Minister, and pretty soon we were all talking about bubbles, who's in your bubble, look out for bubble breaches, it's just become common parlance now and it's thanks to them again, really simple, easy to understand way of communicating to us how should we behave in this pandemic. So I've got to say that in January when we were watching what was happening in Wuhan, um, I never ever imagined that New Zealand would take the step of closing borders. China might do it, um, the city of Wuhan might do it, but we were never ever going to do it, so I thought. And then as the pandemic progressed and you saw it move to other countries in Asia and then to northern Italy and then throughout Europe, and slowly country by country people started putting in border restrictions, so stopping people flying in um, and then closing their borders. It, it really has been an extraordinary year. So this is um, um, the New Zealand uh, epidemic curve of what's happened with COVID. So this was our main um, outbreak, <coughs> first wave if you like. The dotted lines show when we started to put in some restrictions. So initially we were restricting people from traveling from certain countries um, and then there was the complete border closure and then we've got the alert levels um, two, three, four <coughs> that went up in rapid su succession um, to get on top of our outbreak. Level four came in when we had around about 150 cases across New Zealand. Uh, so it was pretty early on when you think what's happened around the world. Um, and it was decided to go high <coughs> and go early and try and stamp it out, which was part of the pandemic plan. And then the curve came down, back down to alert level three, two, one. Um, and here, these ones popping up here are the cases that came in through the managed isolation facilities. So our borders were shut to all but New Zealand citizens and permanent residents. This gap along here was when we hadn't quite got our testing sorted out in the managed isolations. So it looks like we didn't have any cases, probably we did have some, but they were all isolated for 14 days, so we were pretty safe. And then here was the start of the Auckland um, outbreak in August. This is another very familiar figure, um, Dr. Ashley Bloomfield. Um, and again, this has been a remarkable feat, I think, of the, the government and the Ministry of Health to have those one PM <coughs> daily stand-ups. We used to listen into those very religiously. Pretty much everyone up and down the country was waiting for the one o'clock stand-up to say how many new cases, what should we be doing, what alert level are we going to go to? So Dr. Ashley Bloomfield is now a household name. He's got his 
picture on um, tea towels and other things. <laughs> <laughs> so the New Zealand approach, um, as I mentioned, and then around about the 8th of May, New Zealand went a step further and said, we're not only going to try and keep plan for it, keep it out, stamp it out, we want to eliminate it. So <coughs> elimination doesn't mean that we're never going to have any cases. Elimination means that if we have cases, we will manage them and we will control them and we will get rid of whatever small outbreak we hope it will be. But there'll be kind of this wrap around to make sure that we don't have the scenes that we can see in many other parts of the world. Sorry, you can't read that. So um, Warwick talked about, you don't need to read it, it's right. Section 70 of the, the Health Act. Um, and this is just something that's been pulled out from that section to show that actually we have had the mechanisms in place in legislation if we did come to a pandemic. So requiring persons to submit themselves for medical examination, for testing, quarantining, isolating, commandeering places or buildings, closing things down, it was all there in our legislation. Um, however, what the government decided was they wanted a more, I guess, bespoke uh, legislation to deal with COVID-19 in particular. So the COVID-19 Public Health Response Act um, came into being, was passed, standalone legislation, um, but it pretty much covered the similar things to that that were in the Health Act 1956. Under that came the epidemic notice and orders. So we've got a whole series of orders, um, alert level orders and enforcements and requirements, epidemic notice, the border orders, so the maritime <coughs> border, the air border, what um, people have to do, who needs to be tested and so forth, health act orders, managed <coughs> isolation and quarantine, um, and then the temporary visa holders, which you'll be aware that many people were granted extensions to their visas so they could stay in New Zealand and didn't need to return. So the Act allows the Minister of Health or the Director General to make orders under Section 11 that gives effect to the public health response. These are, are constantly being updated um, and we as medical officers have to keep our eye on the ball to make sure we know what is the latest order, what are the latest testing requirements, etc. Um, again, coming back to the communications, so Warwick showed an example of that very formal uh, way of communicating. This is what we have now um, in poster form, on TV, advertisement, all around the country. Um, and I have to say one of the unintended positive consequences of all of this is that we've, been, we've seen an extraordinary decrease in other respiratory illnesses. Since about March this year, we haven't had any influenza in New Zealand, which is extraordinary. No hospitalizations, no people out in the community. It's just disappeared. Early in our outbreak, we were testing for COVID and for doing the rapid influenza test. Um, and like I said, from about March onwards, we never had any positives at all. We've still had rhinovirus circulating, but there's been a massive reduction in hospitalizations due to other respiratory illnesses, both for children and adults. So what happened in Southern? Well, from January, um, a bunch of us at the DHB were watching what was happening in China, and our plan indicated that we should set up an Emerging Infectious Diseases Coordinating Committee, which we duly did, and we were actually meeting every day from, I don't know, second part of January through. We could see what was happening in China and it's spreading to other countries and we knew that it was just a matter of time before it came to New Zealand and then came to Southern. Um, so what we did when we started getting cases was we set up under the SIM structure, which is the Critical Incident Management System. This is a system that um, goes across sectors and it's under our Emergency Act um, under the government legislation. So health does it, and def um, earthquake, uh, civil defence, and so forth. This, however, has been the first uh, emergency that health has had to take the lead. So we've had earthquakes and fires and so forth, and health has been part of that um, in a supporting role, but hasn't had to take the lead. So COVID-19 
was actually the first time that health was in the forefront and taking the lead. So at a DHB level, we had our controller, we had a health emergency coordinating centre set up, which was our liaison with the ministry uh, coordinating centre, but also with civil defence, emergency services and other health agencies. And then under that at our DHB, we had emergency operating centres for primary care, public health, um, aged residential care and hospitals. This was one of the first posters that we put up. Um, as the outbreak developed, we, the case definition changed and sometimes it was changing every couple of days. It was a very <coughs> difficult thing to keep on top of. So initially it was, have you travelled to China? Um, and then when it started spreading, we would add countries. So we've got Iran, Northern Italy, Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore, then all of Italy, um, South Korea, and then eventually it was like, you know what, if you've travelled at all, you're eligible for a test. So it was really tricky to keep up with that, um, especially for our GPs who were, at the, who were at the front line of doing our testing response. Um, and initially we did have a very narrow spectrum of who was eligible to be tested. Um, when we in Southern, we noticed that we had um, people that hadn't travelled were coming up with COVID symptoms. So about a week ahead of the national guidance changing, we changed our local guidance to say, if you've, um, if you've been in touch or had close contact with a traveller and you have these symptoms, you should be tested also. <coughs> and sure enough, we had taxi drivers and bus drivers who tested positive. Um, yeah, a lot of different events. I never expected that I'd be closing schools or businesses, but in the end, that's what we needed to do. So this is the um, epidemic curves from all the different DHVs, or exhibit small. The one in red, that's us in Southern. These are the Auckland DHVs in Waikato up there. Um, we had a short, sharp increase in our cases. Um, and at one point we had the most uh, absolute number of cases out of all the DHBs and certainly we had by far the highest rate. So it was an enormous um, workload. This is a, a heat map. So we've got our hotspots of Queenstown, Dunedin and Undercargill. And people ask, you know, why was Queenstown a big hotspot? Well, it was a big tourist centre. March is the peak tourist time. First half of March we had the Hereford Conference. We know that we had people from at least 18 different countries flying in. Many of those countries had um, their COVID um, outbreaks were ramping up but it wasn't yet recognised and so they were allowed to come in freely without needing to self-isolate when they got here. So that kicked off that. We had the Black Wedding Cluster which um, generated a lot of traffic down here. But you can see those kind of blue blocks shows that we had COVID throughout our whole district, which made it, we, we're a very large geographic um, area, made it pretty tricky to manage. So we had our first case notified um, on uh, Saturday, March the 14th. I was on call, I got a call from the lab saying, you've got a positive. It was um, a tourist that had come in that was in Queenstown. Um, and I have to say from that day on, life was completely hectic for the next um, few months. And I want to do a big shout out to my public health colleagues, our public health team, but also to the wider DHP, to the technical advisory group <coughs> with which are uh, here tonight. Um, it was really an extraordinary time. At our peak, we had 100 people trained to do contact tracing. So our public health unit staff, but also wider DHB, um, we had uh, Dunedin City Council, um, people also helping us. So it really was a huge team effort from our laboratory, who um, were incredible at getting testing up and running so quickly. In fact, they had the test up and running on Friday the 13th, and on Saturday the 14th we had our first positive. So incredible time and also our secondary care colleagues who we were hoping that we wouldn't have but we're still planning that our hospitals may become, may become overwhelmed. So this kind of looks like the um, outbreak curve for uh, Dunedin. 
In fact, that's my resting heart rate. <laughs> um, and this was our outbreak curve of cases being notified to us each day. So short and sharp, happily my, my resting pulse rate has almost come back to normal. Uh, this little blip here was when I was asked to go to Auckland a couple of weeks ago to help with their latest response. <laughs> so it has been an extraordinary year. I think we're all happy to come to the end of 2020. And I think we can come now with some great hope because we know that there's three or four vaccines that have shown really good um, efficacy and effectiveness in the trials to date. Um, they're already being manufactured um, and it's hoped that by the end of the first quarter next year, so March or April, we should have the first lot of vaccines available to start vaccinating in New Zealand. Having said that, it's still going to be 12 months, 18 months before everyone is vaccinated so that we can go to what I think is never going to be business as usual. It's going to be kind of post-COVID business as usual. So we'll just finish with our Prime Minister's words of peace for all time and we'll be okay. Questions? Yes, you, you said that in Dunedin, the flat area had, I take it, higher numbers and mm -hmm. higher rate. What about other flat areas in New Zealand, like for example, Christchurch, which used to get smaller than that? So, is there, is there any uh, like records from, say, what happened to Inokaga, which is flat? What happened in Christchurch, which is flat, yeah. compared to perhaps Wellington, which is not flat? I've not looked into that, but there may well be some points there. Um, a lot of it, I think, was the socioeconomic period. Um, the area around here uh, was full of poor accommodation, um, and some medical students at the time for their... Um, their dissipations were taking photographs of, of uh, what were very definitely slum conditions. And this was one of, for me, one of the sad things that uh, you had people volunteering to assist with the pandemic who were moving largely from the more affluent suburbs. And what an eye opener it was for them to see the conditions in which the other half were living. So there was this flurry we've got to clean up the cities. We've got to get rid of the slums, but of course that was very soon forgotten uh, in Dunedin and, and elsewhere. Mm. Thanks. Question? Yes, ma'am. Dr. Jack, you're talking about vaccines, and we'll have to go several, but we don't know how long they, they're going to last, do we? We don't know what the efficacy is going to be. Is a treatment being worked on at the same time? They're looking at all sorts of treatments. Unfortunately, the ones that they've done the studies on, there hasn't been one that's outstanding. Mm -hmm. um, people have gotten much, much better at looking after people with COVID. Mm -hmm. Happily, we haven't had to have that experience, but mm -hmm. certainly in the US, UK, other parts of Europe, they have. Um, the latest stuff that I've read, they think that the vaccine will perhaps last longer. The studies are showing that immunity is perhaps longer lasting than what we had thought it might be. But you're absolutely right with the studies and we haven't had it long enough to but it's not going to go away, is it? It's <coughs> not. not not at this point. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Why was it that the nineteen eighteen epidemic seemed to fade and this one doesn't? <laughs> I will, I will yeah, it, it, was, it was more than a year before the 1918 really yeah. got down, and so yeah. we, we're not in that stage yet. I think. But do we think that in, let's say, 2022, with or without the vaccines, we might get? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's the current thinking. Yeah. Hopefully, with 2022, mm -hmm. might be better. Okay. Thanks, John. Catherine. Yeah, we, we looked at the first half of the presentation and that these treatments 
preventive treatments that we sort of go, oh, 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 you know, we're, they're, how, they're how quaint, how funny, why did they think that? Um, do you think in a hundred years' time that they're going to look back on our responses to COVID and go, ho, 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 why did they do all those silly things? And if so, which which aspects of the preventive measures do you think might might fall into that category? Mm. It, it's a good question, and there's some people that strongly feel <coughs> we didn't need to have such a strict lockdown and why are we trying to do elimination and so forth. Um, You'll notice on those posters there's something about wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been, for reasons I'm still struggling to understand, somewhat controversial in New Zealand. But it's studies that have come out, places like Taiwan, where it's had an extraordinary um, response. They all wear masks. Um, we had one case, and in, in Southern, we've done some analysis um, and after lockdown, we had more household transmission of COVID, which is understandable because everybody was inside. Very hard to physically distance and be properly isolated in your own house with your own family or flatmates. Um, but we had one guy who absolutely stayed in his room and if he was ever out, he wore a mask. And he was in quite a crowded household, but nobody else got it. So you're right, we will look back, mind you, we look back 100 years and say, oh my goodness, we're just digging out the same things, we're doing the same things. Um, so, yeah. They're, and they're simple measures, right? The physical distancing and the hand washing, I think they're all really great messages, copy it. John. John. The way you described it, in um, 1918, it took quite a long time to declare um, a dangerous disease. Uh, yeah. Are we more than it? Well, I'm interested yeah, if you have uh, thoughts about why it took that long, and are we more nimble about that now? Yeah, and sorry, I forgot to say that by the 30th of January, COVID was a notifiable disease in New Zealand. So the government saw what was happening, saw the writings on the wall, it's going to be coming at some point. We'll make it notifiable, and therefore all those legislative powers will be there right from the get-go um, so yes, we are more nimble. I mean, communication is so much easier. The, um, China informed WHO, I think it was 31st of December, that they had this unusual pneumonia. By the 12th of January, they had sequenced uh, the virus and then had shared that globally. Mm -hmm. So both of those things are extraordinary, how fast they did it and then actually sharing it and then all around the world, people started working on um, how would they test developing the PCR um, technology that, that we use. So that's been a massive difference. And I think that will only get more rapid. I mean, they're saying this isn't going to be our last pandemic. So I hope that we get a little bit of recovery time. Um, not quite ready for another one yet. And the mechanisms simply weren't there in 1918, uh, when you think of wartime conditions, um, which was censoring news anyway, um, and the, that lead time for information, particularly detailed information like journals, uh, reached New Zealand at least six weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's some, some big differences there. Um, yeah. And the, the lack of an international forum uh, such as we had through WHO, was, uh, I'm very glad New Zealand picked that up and ran with it um, after the uh, pandemic. Um, and that clearly led to um, the forerunner of WHO. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you think New Zealand has done uh, good? Could we have done any better? I'll tell you the reason. There's a catch in that. On 21st of January, I was uh, coming through Singapore. Everybody, I mean, if the plane was stopped and they checked everybody for symptoms of fever, cold, etc. And there was a lady sitting next to me and sniggling all, all along to Auckland. And so I wrote to the Minister of Health at that time and suggested maybe you should screen people coming from overseas pretty straight away. And it took eight weeks for the, for the department to do anything. So have we done enough? 
Yeah. Screening at airports is quite controversial. Um, they, John, you can probably go <coughs> war during the swine flu pandemic. It, it, it helps people feel better, um, but it doesn't necessarily have the effect that we think it will be. So, I mean, if you screen someone, if they've got symptoms, that's one thing. Um, but otherwise, you know, you have to catch someone when they've got that fever or got that sniffle, and then the day later when they become unwell, you've, you've already missed them. So now bringing people in and then being isolated for 14 days um, is much more effective. Should people be tested before they come? Um, it depends on the quality of their testing. And some people that have come into New Zealand uh, have had tests before they come, they test negative, they arrive and three days later they've tested positive. So either they got it on the plane or the their one that they had wherever they came from wasn't as accurate. So yeah, there's a lot of um, interesting things. Could we have done any better? I think um, going into lockdown, certainly before lockdown, some of our cases had up to 150 close contacts. Uh, so a huge, huge workload. After lockdown, it was no more than the household unless they were a central worker. Um, so that certainly helped public health stay on top of things. Um, yeah, we can always do things better, but I think New Zealand has had a reasonable balance at what they're doing. Um, I'm so lucky. <laughs> You should have a question. Yes. Um, it's, it's really interesting, contrast, you know, fascinating contrasting with the two responses, but also, you know, obviously the rapidity of information sharing and what have you. But one of the key determinants seems to be whether or not politicians or those in power are willing to give the advice of public health professionals. Yep. And that probably won't change. Yeah, I mean, we're extraordinarily fortunate that the Director General is a public health physician, mm. um, and so he obviously understands about public health. Not all our DGs have been uh, <coughs> medically trained, and he, you know, the previous one was an accountant. So, yeah, we are an extraordinary fortunate position at this time to have who we've had in those positions of power willing to make those decisions. Arthur, was it? Yeah, um, I was just like personally blown away at um, how Dunedin raised 40% of the population infected within like less than two months. Um, sorry, can you, can you say that again? Oh, sorry. I was personally blown away just like how um, quickly the population was infected in Dunedin um, like, and how much of it. And it seems to have been a lot more than um, than like what ha has happened with the coronavirus countries that still haven't um, been so affected with the pandemic measures. So I was just wondering, is there a massive difference between how affected, uh, sorry, the influence of the virus was versus the uh, COVID virus? I did. I couldn't really answer that question. Um, I think the various pandemics we've had uh, and experienced with, with flu generally in its variations uh, has probably given us a few basic rules which weren't around um, in those days. Um, if you look through the report of the um, influenza um, epidemic commission of inquiry, You'll find all sorts of terms there which uh, have their, um, their modern day equivalents. Um, but I don't think they were necessarily seen as such. Social distancing, for example. Um, and the politicians' reluctance to intervene to stop the, the public outpouring of celebration. Um, and you look at the sharp peaks which followed that. Um, no politician is going to risk uh, his or her name on uh, by trying to suppress celebration after uh, four years of, um, of misery. Um, so again, I think that that link between uh, a receptive minister or ministers 
um, and advice being given in the right way and picked up by politicians. It's, it's a hand and glove situation, mm. which is absolutely crucial when you've got a, a, a pandemic. Um, so, you've got a question. Mm. Surely coming out of the Great War, when the government had a great deal of control and the community responded to that, people would have been more compliant when instructions came from on high over this pandemic. Mm. And we don't have that degree of community um, recognition of mm. community strength when we act together. Yeah. Yeah. Gil. Yeah. Well, we were taught that a lot of the secondary mortality with pneumonia was Haemophilus influenzae with the uh, fl 1918 flu. We don't hear much about secondary bacterial infection. Is it a problem in this pandemic or is our COVID-19 not as predisposed to doing that? That's a good question. I don't think, I think people expected that to happen, but when they've done um, post-mortems on people who've died, it, the virus seems to have got into many uh, body organs um, and almost destroying lungs. Um, so, I, but I, I think for, I've read reports from China and basically they were given antivirals, um, antibacterials, they were given anything, steroids, everything all at once to, to try and decrease mortality. I haven't really kept up with all the, the clinical side of things, so I can't give you the definitive answer, sorry. So let's say we get 5 million dosage of the vaccine. Uh, it will still take a certain amount of time for everybody to be vaccinated. Yeah. Who will make that list? Uh, eligibility prioritise um, who gets it first, who gets it last. Yeah. Is so it payable for the public or, you know? Yeah. So New Zealand, uh, the Ministry have got a team that are working on that very question and the early indications are there will be frontline health workers, people working in the managed isolation facilities, um, borders, and then it will be elderly, Māori and Pacific, so people that are more vulnerable if they should get COVID, mm -hmm. um, and then it'll be the rest of the country. Okay, but do we know if, like, let's say the frontline worker is vaccinated, exposed to the virus, does he bring it home? Do I know, am I safe at home, or would I, you know? If you're vaccinated? If I'm not vaccinated, if yeah. the other part of the household is vaccinated, but yeah. is he a carrier? Do we know that? No, they won't be a carrier if they've been vaccinated. They, it's, it, it's not transmissible like that. <coughs> so, yeah. mm -hmm. Good. Yes. Is there anything in the legislation uh, in terms of the people who refuse to get tested? Yeah, I mean, the good thing with COVID is that um, the reproductive um, the R0 is, what is it, two to three. And so if you've got 60 to 70% of your population vaccinated, you will achieve so-called herd immunity. So if you've got five or 10% who don't want to have the vaccine, to be honest, I'm not too worried about that. If we get 70, 80% of our population vaccinated, we'll be covered. Um, it's not like measles, which is highly, highly infectious. Uh, one person can infect 16 others. Here, COVID, one person infects sort of two to three others, and that's if you don't have any of the physical distancing or other measures. So it's not as highly infectious as measles, where you need 95% coverage to get herd immunity. I, I get that, but I'm just interested in the legislation in terms of whether or not, if you refuse a test, yep. whether there's any um, consequence of that in the law. So they have had some people going through managed isolation who have refused to be tested and they make them stay another 14 days. So you have your 14 days and then you stay another 14. So if you want to stay in managed isolation for 28 days, you can refuse to be tested. Great for you. Another question? Yes. Uh, in between 1918 flu and COVID, did that change? the management that we inherited from 1918, because there was a massive closure of schools uh, and places of worship and places of 
the creation for months. Uh, did it change the legislation, make it tighter? Yeah. I'm a little rusty on, on the legislation surrounding it, I'm afraid. Um, Why don't you just use the existing contract provisions? Because it was a, it was a, yeah, it was a generic yeah. 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 yeah, It was yeah. no yeah. 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 There certainly was massive compliance then. Yeah. 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 And that's within most of the audience's lifetime. Huh? And so I, I think this accounts for our readiness in part to do it again. Yeah. I think what will be very interesting to see is what happens when the vaccine is available and mm -hmm. how mass vaccination proceeds. Um, I remember talking um, with a number of public health nurses who were involved in the polio um, uh, vaccinations, uh, and it was run very much as a military operation. Yep. Um, from Wellington, and uh, I hope that, that um, their memories of the organisation which was required to ensure such a high success rate hasn't been lost before the reorganisation in the ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay. Another question? Another questions? Well, please join me in thanking our two speakers for a really wonderful uh, uh, presentation.